History of stone applied to design innovation and development. The historical backdrop of stone applied to design is connected to individuals since the start of our occasions. It was an asylum for the ancient man when he lived in caves, expecting from the beginning of our reality its earthly person and understanding it as our association with the earth. The association between the human and the heavenly. The stone empowered an association with another space and some other time, for instance, at the Stonehenge site, assembled around 2500 BC. Those stones were the medium to associate the human and the heavenly, the earth and the stars. They were brought to last unceasingly the principal tram in America was implicit Boston, Massachusetts in 1897. The Boston tram was worked during the second period of the Industrial Revolution in Massachusetts and was a lot of a result of the mechanical advances made during that time, as per the book Encyclopedia of 20th Century Architecture. The tram is a 19th century thought acknowledged to a great extent in the 20th century. The mechanical upheaval was the essential impetus for the approach of underground transportation, without it the iron pony that pulled the trains, the burrowing innovation that drilled through the earth, and the iron dividers that held those passages up would have been unimaginable. Quote. The Boston tram just came to fruition because of the particular development of the electric engine in the late 19th century. Since Americans were not enthusiastic about the possibility of a metro like one in London, England, which was a steam train that ran in dim passages and heaved debris and residue all over the place, an elective strategy for creating force would be expected to fabricate a tram in the US. Luckily, an American innovator named Frank Sprague tackled this issue when he concocted an electric engine in 1886. After Sprague effectively introduced his engine in streetcars in Richmond, Virginia, in 1888, it incited Henry Whitney, the proprietor of the West End Railway in Boston, Mass., to overhaul his streetcars to run on power the next year. This analysis in clean energy is the thing that later made it conceivable to persuade legislators, finance managers and the overall population that it was doable to run these electric streetcars underground in Boston. Boston had a huge issue with blockage in its roads due to congestion issues and incessant snowstorms and tempests stopping up the city's little, winding provincial period roads. Road blockage turned out to be such an issue that city authorities started conceptualizing approaches to mitigate it, as per the American Society of Civil Engineers website. By the 1890s, the Transportation Foundation of downtown Boston, a labyrinth of tight, winding roads spread out, sometimes, along colonial cow ways, demonstrated totally lacking for the necessities of a cutting-edge, clamoring city. Tremont Street, the city's principal lane, was routinely dependent upon gridlock from an assembly of people walking through, horse-drawn movements, streetcar lines, and electric trolleys. To amend the issue, the Boston Transit Commission, with Howard A. Carson as boss architect, was made in 1894 to concentrate on cures. Quote. Adding to the clog issue was a new flood of settlers from Ireland, Italy, Germany and Eastern Europe, as per the book Beneath the Streets of Boston. Boston's traffic issues surfaced during the 1890s, yet their underlying foundations extended back 50 years to the years when the city's populace genuinely started to detonate. During the 1840s, Boston was the main stop in the New World for great many frantic and hungry foreigners escaping Ireland's sad potato starvation. A constant flow of workers from Italy, Germany, and Eastern Europe added to the numbers, and in only 10 years Boston's populace expanded from 90,000 to 135,000. Public transportation at the time was essentially non-existent so city authorities started making horse-drawn streetcars, which were subsequently supplanted by electric streetcars, to oblige the developing populace. 
These streetcars, joined with passerby traffic, private pony-drawn carriages and taxis just as business carts, made everyday gridlocks in the roads. Arranging the Boston subway. City authorities felt the best answer for this traffic issue was to construct an underground tram and instantly started to lay the basis for another travel framework. Since building a tram under the city roads included a ton of formality, in 1891, the city council approved the development of a rapid transit committee and the state governing body passed a demonstration taking into consideration the arrangement of a panel to advance quick travel in the city. The Rapid Transit Commission comprised of eight individuals. Nathan Matthews Jr., Mayor and Chairman. William Jackson, City Engineer. John Quincy Adams. Chester W. Kingsley. Osborne Howes Jr. Significant Henry L. Higginson. James B. Richardson. John E. Fitzgerald. A portion of these individuals traveled to another country to England, Germany and France to concentrate on transportation strategies there and, following nine months of study, documented a report to city authorities in April of 1892 suggesting various activities. One of the ventures they suggested was a limited-scale tram situated at the most clogged regions, between Tremont Road, Boylston Road and Scully Square. The arrangement for the metro was to interface the underground tram follows the current road tracks of the West End Street Railway in South and West Boston and with the road tracks of the Lynn and Boston Railway in North Boston. This would permit the metro to run on a superficial level roads in the less blocked spaces of the city and underground in the more clogged regions to decrease road traffic above. The subsequent demonstration considered the arrangement of a board of subway commissioners that was approved to spread out and develop a tram from Tremont Street to Pleasant Street. This demonstration was supported by Boston City Council on January 1, 1894. In 1894, the legislature passed a demonstration which took into consideration the consolidation of the Boston Elevated Railway, an exclusive organization that would be liable for building and running a raised railroad line, and furthermore required the production of the Boston Transit Commission WH. The commission was approved to construct various metro lines, as per the Special Publications Periodical. The commission was approved however not needed to develop, one, a tram or metros of adequate size for four railroad tracks through and under Tremont Road and the bordering shopping center of Boston Common from a point close to the intersection of Tremont Road and Shawmut Avenue to Scully Square and two, a tram of adequate width for two tracks just from Tremont Road and through and under Boylston Road and the abutting shopping center of Boston Common to a point on Boylston Road where a reasonable association with the surface tracks could be made, and from Boylston Road through and under Park Squee. 3. A metro from Tremont Road through and under Park Road, Temple Road, and Staniford Road to Merrimack Square, and 4. A passage from a point on or close to Scully Square to a point on or close to Maverick Square in East Boston. They were additionally needed to build a scaffold to Charlestown. The demonstration further approved an issue of bonds to the measure of $7 million for the development of trams and an adequate total, notwithstanding $750,000 currently appropriated by the City Council, to finish the Charlestown Bridge. The demonstration was endorsed on July 2, 1894 and acknowledged by the electors of Boston in an exceptional political decision hung on July 24, 1894. While arranging the format of the Boston subway, the Boston Transit Commission became mindful that pieces of the central burying ground close to Boylston Street potentially lay in the way of the tram. The commission asked Dr. Samuel Green, the previous mayor of Boston and the curator for the Massachusetts Historical Society, to compose a report about the historical backdrop of that plot of land and requested guidance on how to manage any uncovered remaining parts. Likewise, the commission additionally inquired as to whether there was any well-being hazard implied in uncovering dead bodies. Green presented the accompanying report on December 20, 1894. 
This bundle of land was purchased by the town in the year 1756 for a position of interment, and from that point forward it has kept on being utilized for that item. The first entombments were made in quite a while, and, so exceptionally far as presently can be determined, the most punctual burial place. Thanks for watching by now. If you enjoyed this video be sure to give it a like and subscribe to life is often if you haven't already click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.